sir. I've made sure we're using the right ones this time. I don't know. I have Oh, that was excellent timing. Well done. Thank you. And welcome to the Arlene Schnitzer Concert Hall in another Oregon Symphony pre-concert conversation. I'm Robert McBride. That's Carlos Kalmar over there, music director of the Oregon Symphony. Hi, Center, everybody. Don't you know? And if you look at your program, you'll see the name Gabriel Kahane, composer of the last piece tonight. And this is Mr. Kahane right here. who has taken it upon himself to do something that seems to me that it would be very difficult. A while back he got a phone call, uh, the Oregon Symphony asking him to write a piece on the subject of homelessness and, and the search for home. How would, how would you go about doing that if you were a composer and somebody asked you to do that? These are the questions that I'll be asking Gabriel in a minute. I live downtown. So I see homelessness every day and every night, and I buy Street Roots, the homeless person's newspaper, every week, which costs a dollar and has the wonderful slogan, the buck starts here. And a few days ago, I was walking my dog just a few blocks from here, and I heard the Spring Concerto from the Four Seasons by Vivaldi, coming from a little impromptu camplet uh, a homeless woman who's from Israel, homeless on the streets of downtown Portland. She's got a couple of umbrellas and these other little bits of shelter. And she has a little hand crank radio. And she was listening to all classical Portland at four in the afternoon, playing the Portland Baroque Orchestra's recording of Spring from the Four Seasons. So there's, there's an interesting reality check. Um, and I, I mention that because it's ever so timely. So, Mr. Kahane, look at these titles. What brings you here? Chorus of Inconvenient Statistics. I love that. Tell us what thought process you went through with this project. Yeah. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and to be working with Carlos and with the Oregon Symphony, which I think is truly one of the finest orchestras uh, in America. <laughs> Can I have that $50 now? <laughs> um, when Charles Calmer called me and asked if I would write a piece about homelessness, my initial instinct was to say absolutely not. Um, the optics alone felt untenable to me in the sense that this is an institution that sadly caters primarily to people of incredible privilege, although I realize that there are wonderful initiatives here that that do create access to the arts, but often access is not just about economics, it's also about uh, whether or not you feel comfortable entering a space. Um, so I wanted to say no, but I was also being invited to write half a program for an orchestra that I knew was phenomenal. <laughs> so I said yes. <laughs> and then I got to work trying to figure out how to tackle it. And I think the first thing that I would say is that this is not a piece about homelessness, it's a piece about income inequality and deep poverty in America and about growing deep poverty in America. There's something like two million people in this country who live on less than two dollars a day. And that's the UN's metric for what they consider to be not just poverty, but deep poverty. And when I think about homelessness, as I got deeper into my research and began volunteering at a shelter in New York and was reading books like Matthew Desmond's wonderful book, Evicted, and, and a book called Two Dollars a Day by two sociologists, um, it became clearer and clearer to me that, that homelessness is, and housing insecurity more broadly is just you know, it's symptomatic of, of income inequality. And in a sense, to write a piece about homelessness um, is, you know, if you really wanted to write a piece about cancer and instead wrote a piece about weight loss, there's, there's a way in which um, you're writing about the symptom as opposed to the root cause. And so I, I, I do think um, as you experience the text um, of, of this work, it's, uh, I would argue that its, it's breadth is greater than, than just addressing um, the experience of housing insecurity, but, but 
these questions of what do we pay for? Do we keep the lights on? Do we buy groceries? Um, and it's, you know, I, I want to commend at the outset um, the symphony for sticking to this piece, which is provocative. And I think it will make some people uncomfortable. And you can blame me. Don't blame them. <laughs> Well, we're already uncomfortable because we're <laughs> reminded of a very uncomfortable reality yeah. in our nation at this time, other nations too, of course, yeah. but Portland has changed so much. I can remember when there was one homeless person in Portland that I knew of, he, would, he had a broom, he had a push broom, and he would sweep up around dumpsters downtown you know, 20 years ago or something. And, and there are so many of them now, we see them so often. And the texts that you chose have to do with, well, emergency shelter intake form. The things that they have to talk about, fill out forms about, be evaluated about to get some shelter. Yeah. I just want to interject one thing, which is that in, in your comment about seeing someone experiencing homelessness, I think one of my great misconceptions um, before I got into research for this piece is the notion that someone is experiencing homelessness over, only if they're on the street, and that's not the case. The vast majority of, of people who are, are considered by HUD, um, federally speaking, to be experiencing homelessness are living with friends, living with family, um, living in hotels, living in motels, living in transitional housing, all of these kinds of things. And it's, there's a way in which that invisible experience of homelessness is even more insidious because we're, we are truly able to sweep it under the rug. And Portland, San Francisco, Los Angeles obviously have um, tragic and incredibly uh, visible um, populations experiencing homelessness. But How I, visible? I, what is it in Brooklyn where you live? Well, there's a really interesting thing about New York City, and some of this has to do with climate, of course. But New York City passed a law many years ago uh, which says that anyone who lacks shelter must be given shelter and a bed if they come into an intake center. And so there is... Now, getting that bed, it, it, you have to go through a lot of hoops, and there's a way in which that's what this piece is about. Um, and the banality of, of poverty, um, the banality of the bureaucracy that, that you're asked to go through. Um, but there is, interestingly, I mean, I, I, I was interested in these statistics. There is less unsheltered homelessness in New York City whose population is six or seven times greater than, than Portland's. Obviously, we have a much larger homeless population overall, but the unsheltered population in New York is smaller than the unsheltered population in Portland. Ouch. Well, let's get back to this, <laughs> these words as music. Yeah. How do you, I mean, what brings you here? What happened? Where did you sleep last night? So did melodies occur to you looking at those words? So this, the, the libretto is, is somewhat of, um, Carlos, you're talking too much. <laughs> he always does that. Trust me, everybody should be happy that because you know, the word is, don't give him a mic, he never stops talking. So, um, getting to the point where I understood structurally how I wanted to approach this piece involved a lot of tearing out of hair. And I, when I was interviewing people who had experienced homelessness, they, this phrase kept coming up, which is sleeping in chairs. Sleeping in chairs is anytime you're trying to gain access to a shelter, there's a kind of vetting or hazing process where in order to get the bed, you have to sleep at the intake center and you're monitored at the intake center to sort of, so that those who are going to place you can learn whether you have mental illness, whether you have substance abuse problems, so on and so forth. And so once you've filled out all this paperwork and gone from you know, building to building, you have this experience of sleeping in chairs. And it made me more interested in um, actually looking at these forms that, that folks have to fill out and then I started to think, well, to, to simply just set an intake form would be very dry. And so I started to create what one might call a palimpsest, where 
I began with an actual intake form and then started making erasures and adding my own text that often came from interviews that I had done uh, with, with people I had met. But there is a kind of structural integrity where the first 12 movements, everything in the piece is stated as a question, um, beginning with what, what brings you here. But some of these questions begin to drift from the kind of clinical and into a more lyrical space, a more personal space, a space um, which you'll hear the, the wonderful Misha Berger Gossman inhabiting, where she sort of suggests these glimpses of all these different characters while always at the same time operating as this, this kind of um, autocratic gatekeeper. The, the lioness at the gate. Carlos, how did this music strike you when you looked at it the first time? Which was when, by the way? Well, actually... <laughs> Don't answer that. <laughs> actually, this is... Uh, the, uh, it's hard to express, actually, because there are so many thoughts that I have in regards to this concert in particular that go actually beyond the fact that we have a fantastic in the Myth overture and the great Joshua Bell here. But I think that what Gabriel has created, uh, I'm very, very grateful for being part of it. Because uh, at the end of the day, um, I've thought very, very often, why, why do we do what we do? And I can only speak uh, for myself. Why do I try to do what I do? Um, and one, oh, there are many reasons. Um, and one of the reasons is actually in order to be capable to participate in, uh, in doing the world premiere, or even if it wouldn't be the world premiere nonetheless, it would be a great deal of intense thought process that goes into this piece. Because so you, what I'm trying in not so eloquent words to express is you get, as always, a score. You look at the score, you try to figure out how this works, then you think here and there, ah, I know this one, I know that one. Then you go through the process of meeting the soloists, um, rehearse with them, then you start working with the orchestra and you start working with everybody, including the really very interesting presence of the chorus of the, the Mabel communities. Uh, center chorus and then the piece starts growing on you and the reason it starts growing on you is because at least as far as I'm concerned I, I think I hope that I can see beyond the fact that some parts of this piece might be perceived as being provocative because I don't I actually don't think so uh, the word, because the way I understand the word provocative is um, in order, it, it always has this aftertaste, at least right now, of uh, something that is being heavily politicized. And this is, yes, this is of course a politic, it's a political piece, but not at all in the sense of those on the right, those on the left, those in the middle, those in the, down there. None of that. It's just, and what I get from this piece, aside from absolutely stunning music that travels in very different directions, there are, so it's, a, I could describe it in telling you, look, it's a bunch of songs, <laughs> which is a real heavy understatement of what this is. But if I would say that, then I can tell you there are songs that are, uh, uncomfortably sad just because they state facts that we might not want to hear. There are songs, at least two of them, that are really funny and you want to gag when you laugh. And then there is uh, the ending which I don't want to describe because you will hear what it is. And it's, it's, there, there is absolute magic there. Uh, but I have thought that, uh, if, if I may, 
uh, say this too. This is the ending project of uh, the three projects that we've done uh, at the Oregon Symphony in this season based on social themes. And the results of each of them, and we have not yet played this for you, but I can tell you what my perception is, that uh, the, the one in the middle about environment was really interesting, really well done by Matthew Haber. The orchestra played phenomenal. And it was mostly pretty, if I can say that in the best sense of the word. The, the, the one about emigration took actually a look at the idea of emigration and diverted from it because it was more about the sense of loss rather than about really emigration. This piece is the one that really, um, without, I don't think intentionally, just by establishing facts, sticks actually the finger here and there in our eye. And I'm very, very grateful, for, uh, and I wish all the entire audience could have heard what Gabriel said about uh, being homeless, meaning lack of home, because uh, what really gets me is there are so many people out, yes, I know, there are so many people on the street in pretty much every neighborhood who sleep there. Um, but there are so many people who actually we don't see and they don't have a home either. And one thing that this piece, and uh, I blame you for uh, <laughs> that made me think really hard about is um, a non-musical thought, if you will, is this piece makes me remember that it can affect everybody. E all of you, me, everybody. We can just like this. I, I would love to interject there, if, if I may. I'm so glad you brought that up, because that, that is something that I'm trying to communicate, and I'm glad you're picking up on it, which is that we, so many of us, are one medical emergency away from having to make a terrible choice between do, you know, do we pay the hospital bill? Do we pay the mortgage? And I think that one of the challenges in really confronting poverty and confronting the idea of homelessness is it's the, the sense that there is a lack of proximity to our lives. And what I've learned through interviewing the folks who have been so generous with their time is that people, I, I've interviewed lawyers lawyers who lost their homes, um, successful artists who lost their homes. It's, it's, it happens to everyone. And we have an idea that if you're, if you're experiencing homelessness, it's because you made a mistake. And I really, really would like to push against that sensibility. As far as I know, I only know one person who has been homeless. It was a long time ago. She lived in her car for a while. Anybody here know personally somebody who's had to deal with that? Yeah, we got some hands, got some nodding. It's not so distant. It's right here in this room. Uh, brought vividly to life by your music tonight. I should tell you that Gabriel has traveled all over the country and interviewed lots and lots of people about lots of things and has written lots of songs inspired by those. You've become a kind of cultural anthropologist. You're gonna write I'll a take it. <laughs> are you gonna honorary doctorate as far as I'm concerned. Are you gonna write a book about this someday? Um, hey, do you know how, I don't know how old he is, but I always say, oops. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> what about the other singers? You mentioned the soprano oh, solo. Yeah, that is, that is very, no, no, you actually, because you know them better, but even that is, it's stunning. The, so you have the Oregon Symphony, you know the Oregon Symphony. It's a great group of individual musicians who work so hard to, to, to do what they do. And then we have uh, four soloists and a chorus. And just, yeah. I think it's better if you introduce. So. Misha Bruger gossman who is sort of our star of the evening, she and I met at the Verbier Festival in 2006 in Switzerland. And curiously, uh, Joshua Bell, whom I've known since I was a tiny tyke, because my father used to work with him quite a bit, um, Josh was also at that festival. And somewhere I have in my possession 
a photograph of Misha blow-drying Josh's hair as he came off stage soaked in sweat. And <laughs> so, in a sense, this program means a lot to me, just for <laughs> the presence of both, both Misha and, um, and Josh. When, when I heard Misha in 2006, she was singing um, Berg, I think it was Lulu Sweet, that's, yeah? Absolutely, yeah. of course. And I was just completely bowled over. It's extremely difficult music, and she, she sang it effortlessly. And then a few hours later, I was there with the, the great German bass baritone, Thomas Kwastoff. Oh, oh. He and I were playing a jazz recital, which is a, a different story, which we won't get into. <laughs> and after that concert, we ended up in the hotel bar, and suddenly Misha and Tommy and I were singing jazz standards at the piano. And I often do a lot of performing, you know, on my own with orchestras and clubs and so on and so forth. And when I was initially approached about this, the idea was that I would write for myself. It would be me plus orchestra. And I thought, no, I should write for someone who's a truly great singer. And, and so I called up Misha and I said, look, I have this crazy idea. And she said, yes, I'll do it. Sign me up. And then about two months ago, when I was sort of in the throes of working on the piece, I realized that I needed something of a Greek chorus. Um, I needed a small group that could kind of provide essentially an emotional counterpoint to um, how heavy everything was that Misha was going to be singing, but also to sort of stand outside of the action and to give us a kind of a sense of theater, a sense of levity. And I immediately thought of my dear friend Holcomb Waller, whom some of you may know, who's a local treasure, incredible singer, songwriter, composer, mathematician. Um, he's, he's one of the most brilliant people I've ever met. And I called Holcomb and I said, would you do this? And he said, sign me up. And I said, can you recommend someone else who is not a classical singer, um, but who has a real energy, who, you know, who's maybe an improviser, doesn't sing with a lot of vibrato? And he said, Holland Andrews. Holland, whom I'm just getting to know and who is a really astonishing artist in her own right, she's a composer, clarinetist, improviser, works a lot in the experimental music scene. She has a band uh, called Like a Villain, and um, I've just gotten to know her this week. And so she and Holcomb and I, we are the chorus of Inconvenient Statistics, as you will hear later on. And then you have Misha, and then finally, we have the Maybell Community Chorus. Um, and this chorus comprises, um, does, how many of you are familiar with the Maybell Center? Just a couple. So the Maybell Center, which has been around for I think 27 years, something like that, has this extraordinary mission, which is specifically to create community for those who are living isolated lives and often impoverished and isolated lives. And the belief that by, by giving community uh, and a space in which people can uh, have social encounters in a safe environment, that this will make them healthier. And so if they do house people and clothe people and feed them, but that's not their primary goal. The primary goal is to create community. And one of the ways in which they do that is through this chorus. And so many of the singers who are singing in this piece tonight are, are or have experienced housing insecurity or have experienced homelessness, or are experiencing some, some kind of poverty. And to work with them has been extremely moving. And uh, I am so grateful to them for their courage um, and for the, the generosity of spirit that they've given us. Absolutely. Are they nervous? I, I, I think uh, the, the thing, of course, I mean, <laughs> The funny thing is... I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to ask you, but thank you. for I, I'm, I'm not actually, right now, but I will be in an hour. The, the, the thing is, uh, the, the, the Mabel community singers, of course, the, the first... I mean, they were really very well prepared. Crystal is their uh, wonderful choir director. And then, of course, comes the day when the composer, the conductor comes in, and it's like, oh my God, those are the whatever. And I think it happened during this rehearsal that that was uh, undoubtedly one of the most moving uh, encounters with other human beings uh, that I've ever had. And it, it was 
just what they, what they were able in this rehearsal to give is absolutely stunning. And that's why at the end of the day, uh, I don't want to talk too much about the last movement because then I, I get like, I, I, this is not about describing something musical. Just experience what, what it actually does. And I hope it does a lot. And I would just say um, the, th the thing that I am most excited by with respect to this project is the idea that it is an act of community building, both in the sense that Holland and Holcomb, I think, are, are two of the great artists um, living in this community. The Organ Symphony is extraordinary. These, these people, the Maybell community singers, are extraordinary. And I, I hope that this engagement does not end when the concert ends. I, I hope that you'll have an opportunity to talk to me, talk to Holcomb, talk to Misha, talk to the Maybell singers, um, because I think that to truly, um, to truly see this project to fruition, it doesn't end when the last downbeat occurs, I think. You may have heard of a very famous trumpet player named Gabriel. Did your parents name you after that, Gabe? <laughs> so, interestingly, my, my wife is 35 weeks pregnant with our first child, and we, we don't know uh, its sex or gender. Um, it's going to tell us that gender is a construct when it comes out of the womb, we suspect. <laughs> um, but we've, we have been you know, thinking a lot about how, how you name someone whom you don't really know yet. And the story goes that my parents named me Nathaniel. I was born at home, and about six hours into my life, they were looking at me in the bed, and they said, he's not Nathaniel, he's Gabriel, and that's all I know. <laughs> very, very good story, because essentially, for one reason that I cannot, exp it doesn't have an explanation, I actually think that the best way to name your kid uh, it, essentially is let it happen. <laughs> you, you kid will tell you <laughs> somehow. Uh, at the end of the day, I have, I have a bunch of those and I can really tell you all oh, that's <laughs> very clearly. <laughs> My daughter Svenja, no kidding, that's Svenja, <laughs> etc. So tonight the world becomes a better place starting right here because of this man because of that man and Charles Colmer, who you mentioned earlier, and the commissioning of this wonderful, amazing piece of music. I haven't heard a note of this yet, and I'm really eager now, and I'm sure you are too, after coming to this talk, which has been videotaped, and you can find that on YouTube and the Symphony's website and All Classical Portland's website. And Tell your friends, especially if they're thinking about coming tomorrow afternoon or Monday night, they could really benefit from the conversation we've had. Thank you both, Carlos Calmar and Gabriel Cahane. And Robert McClay. My McClay. pleasure, thank you.